RC network, a resistor and a capacitor, and an LR network, a resistor and an inductor. These are both timing subcircuits, where the size of the resistor and the size of the reactive component have a formula for the charging and discharging rate, or time, tau equals resistance times capacitance, or inductance divided by resistance, and you can use this to make filters and timers and whatnot. But if you have a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor together, you have an oscillating subcircuit, an RLC network, an LC tank, and a few other names, which directly generates a sine wave. Rather than having to make a square wave and filter it, it just makes a sine wave directly. Right here across the resistor is where you usually take it. This resistor could represent your load, for instance. And an LC tank is a core component of a bunch of whole different oscillating circuits. Because on its own, while this does oscillate, it eventually is going to run out of energy and just die. So you need a more complicated circuit to make sure it keeps oscillating. I'll go over this in more detail in a moment, but basically what happens is you add energy to the system. You charge the capacitor, or the inductor, whatever. But you add energy and the capacitor discharges into the inductor. And then the inductor discharges into the capacitor. The capacitor discharges into the inductor. The inductor discharges into the capacitor. Back and forth and back and forth. And it's sinusoidal. Instead of a timing constant for how long it takes to charge or discharge, there's a frequency formula as follows. The frequency is 2 times pi times the square root of the inductance times the capacitance, but all of that is the wavelength. That's how long it takes for the capacitor to be charged in a certain way, go through a full cycle, and get back to the same charge, not counting the energy loss. So you take the reciprocal, divide it into one, and that's the frequency. It's also known as the resonant frequency, and you'll notice that there's no resistance in here. It's the capacitor and the inductor, but the resistor does not affect the frequency. And the reason for that is that the inductor and the capacitor are coupled. The electric field on the capacitor, the magnetic field on the inductor, are coupled and interacting with each other, and that's what's causing the oscillation. The first way you can look at the coupling is your Kirchhoff loop. If you go in a full loop, and you add together all the voltage rises and voltage drops, they must, in total, be zero. So if the capacitor is charged, you might have positive voltage here, you know, voltage drop, voltage drop, whatever. So they must, in the whole loop, add to zero. So they're clearly linked in some way. Furthermore, it's a series circuit. There must be the same current going through all three of these components at the same time, no matter what. You can't have a different current in the inductor versus the capacitor. So they're coupled by the current, you could look at it. But more formally, and the reason it's called resonant frequency, is remember that the capacitor and the inductor are called reactive components. Reactance is the name of effective resistance. So remember your Fourier series. Any signal can be broken up into different frequencies that all come across together. And there is a curve, and you look on your data sheet for your components, because there's all kinds of things that affect it, but in the general case, there is a curve of how much effective resistance there is to a signal versus the frequency of the signal. The reactance of a capacitor is, again, in the ideal case, 2 times pi times the frequency times the capacitance, and all of that, the reciprocal. Whereas the reactance of an inductor is 2 times pi times the frequency of the signal times the inductance, not the reciprocal. So if we graph this, if we have the frequency and we have the reactance, the effective resistance, how much does it seem like that if it was going through a resistor, how much would the signal diminish? For a capacitor, it's more like this, which makes sense because a capacitor is seen as blocking DC. DC is zero frequency, infinite wavelength that never changes. So over here at zero frequency, it's infinite resistance. It blocks the DC. And the higher the frequency, the less the capacitor blocks the signal. Again, don't get into physical details. This is the, the conceptual. And then for the inductance, it's like this. The reactance of the inductor to a DC signal, an inductor mostly just lets it on through, and the higher the frequency, the more the inductor spends charging and discharging and completely demolishes the signal. So the reactances act differently, but there's a point. For whatever the particular curves of these components are and their sizes and so forth, there's a spot where the reactance is the same. For one particular frequency, the reactance matches. So this frequency signal going through 
through the capacitor and this frequency signal going through the inductor both act as if it's the same value resistor, act as if they are a resistor. And here's where I have to wave my hand a little bit and not do calculus. Just take my word for it. They're coupled by voltage, coupled by current, however you want to look at it. As one is discharging into the other, as the capacitor discharges into the inductor, the inductor is reacting to the signal that the capacitor is generating. The capacitor is trying to generate a sine wave signal into the inductor, but the inductor has a reactance. And then the inductor might discharge into the capacitor, and the inductor is trying to create a sine wave signal and send it into the capacitor, and they interact in such a way, physical details, woo -doo -doo, that they equilibrate, they stabilize, they synchronize at this point. And that's where this comes from. If you look at these two formulas, and you just set these equal to each other, right? Set these equal to each other. If we try to isolate frequency, then we multiply frequency over and it's frequency squared, multiply capacitance over and it's times capacitance, multiply two pi over and we've got two squared pi squared, and then we've got equals one. But we can take the reciprocal of both sides, one divided by one is one, so that's still one, but this is now one over. Let's put equals one over here. That's a little more clear. So I did one over one over here equals one, and then took the reciprocal here, multiply the frequency over, now we get frequency squared, but now we want to get rid of the squared, so we take the square root. Well, square root of one is one, square root of two squared is two, square root of pi squared is pi, and then L times C, and there's the square root, and there's your formula. It's just where the reactances are the same. Now you might ask, why doesn't the resistor have an effect? And the reason is, the resistor is a linear component. If you have a signal that looks like this, and then you have a signal that looks like this, minus my bad drafting skills, these hopefully look like the same signal, it's just this one has less amplitude. The curve is not changed, the frequency is not changed, it's just squished a little bit. That's what the resistor is doing. The capacitor and inductor between each other are generating this sine wave. The resistor is always taking a certain voltage drop based on the current, whatever current is going through, you know, voltage equals current times resistance. So whatever current is going through, you can figure out the voltage drop across it and then figure out how much power drops. But the point is, whatever the current at any particular moment, the resistor is taking a chunk of it, but it's always proportional. It's always just a percentage. The resistor, because it's linear, takes a percentage away, and all it does is squish the signal. So if you have your sine wave, it's just going to get big and small and small and small and small and small. And I'll do this in a second video with an actual simulator. The next video will be an actual circuit simulator on the computer so you can see this in great detail in all the numbers. But right now I just want to explain what's going on. This is the reason it doesn't affect the frequency because all it's doing is dropping the voltage by a percentage. It doesn't affect the shape of the wave, it just affects the strength. Now, the resistance does affect something called, I think, the Q factor, which I don't quite understand yet. Basically, it's the quality of the circuit. It's supposed to affect how it responds to other stimuli and how you use it in other pieces. I'll worry about that in a future video. I don't care about the Q factor right now. Right now, it's just creates a sine wave. That's all I care about. So let me forget about the resistor for a moment because it's not really playing a role in the waveform. Let me walk you through the way that this ends up making an oscillation. So down here, let me have my wave. So let's begin with the capacitor charged up. Let's say the capacitor is charged this way. No current is flowing. The capacitor is fully charged to some voltage. So we start time and we have our sine wave begins here. Charge to a positive voltage, we'll say, you know, positive is that way, so we put our probes here. And the inductor is completely discharged because there's no current, no current, no inductor charge. So the capacitor begins to discharge through the inductor. So the current is beginning to flow like so. It doesn't flow immediately because the first thing the inductor does is create the opposing, the back EMF, the voltage to counteract the voltage from the capacitor so that no current actually flows. But at the same time, that opposition is forcing energy into the magnetic field around the inductor, the inductor begins to charge. The more the inductor charges, the more current it lets through. So it begins to let current through slowly, slowly, and then faster, faster, faster as it charges, and the capacitor is discharged. Charging. So the voltage across the capacitor is going down, the opposing voltage across here is going down, and so you get a fall 
like so, until the capacitor has fully discharged. As the capacitor loses its charge, the inductor is charged. The inductor, if you remember conceptually, not in reality, but in conceptually, a capacitor stores voltage, an inductor stores current. So the capacitor was releasing its voltage until the voltage went down to zero. Now that the capacitor is not putting any current through this inductor, the inductor is charged up to a certain current, basically the last level of current it managed to reach before the capacitor ran out. So the inductor begins to discharge the same direction. It wants to maintain the same current that it just had going through it. So the inductor begins to charge the capacitor the other direction. It just puts the charge back in the capacitor except the other way. And then as the inductor discharges, its magnetic field is collapsing, which means that it's not putting out as much current. The current is going down and down and down as the voltage across the capacitor is going up. But remember, we were measuring it where it was positive before. Now it's backwards, so it's gone negative. The inductor runs out of energy, and the capacitor has been successfully charged backwards. And now current flow stops. So now we're at the same voltage level as before. Take my word for it. We're at the same voltage level as before, but now the capacitor is charged backwards. It begins to discharge in the other direction through the inductor. As it does so, it loses its negative voltage. Remember, negative is just relative to how we're measuring it. So the capacitor discharges into the inductor. Initially, no current flows because the inductor blocks it, but then it lets more and more through. The magnetic field charges up, the capacitor loses its voltage, and has discharged. Now the inductor has charged that way, and once the capacitor is not supplying it with current anymore, it begins to discharge and charges the capacitor back up to positive where it was before. And so after the whole cycle, we end up exactly where we were with the capacitor charged. Now, in reality, there's going to be resistance. Even if you don't put a resistor, there's going to be, you know, milli ohms or whatever. So over time, this wave is actually going to diminish and eventually stop because the resistance will constantly be dissipating energy. But in the ideal case, if there was zero resistance, this would just go on forever. And the way that actual oscillators work using this is they, they use the LC tank to provide the frequency signal to actually do the oscillation, and then it's hooked into some sort of amplifier so that the power is fed back in, not too much, just enough to keep it going. We'll get into that in future videos because there's a whole bunch of these, a whole bunch of ways to use this. But that's the basic principle of it. The capacitor discharges into the inductor, which discharges into the capacitor, and then it goes backward. And then if you measure, you know, positive here, negative here, you get your positive and negative voltage sine wave. So in the next video, I'm going to go on a simulator on the computer and show you this in action, both with and without resistance, so that you can get a better feel and see the curves of what the voltage and current are doing and what each component is doing. So until then, I'll be seeing you.